I was trying to think of a good title or a good jumping off point for this sort of presentation. You know, we're basically trying to make a presentation in here that takes some of the success of TED.com and other educational websites that use media and implement media to teach. And the model is 18 minutes and a slideshow and a lot of cameras and present your idea. And I'm trying to not reinvent the wheel. So in order to demonstrate the potential for our system here at St. Scholastica, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are interesting to me. And hopefully, it will speak for itself. As I blog and I get interested in different technologies, I take little notes. And I wrote this statement last Friday. They say, Red Bull gives you wings. I say, we're going to fly around on graphene wings. This is a quote from uh, UTS. Using a synthesized method and heat treatment, the UTS research team has produced material with extraordinary bending, rigidity, and hardness mechanical properties. Now, this is, this is what it blows my mind. Compared to steel, the prepared graphene paper is six times lighter, five to six times lower density, two times harder with 10 times higher tensile strength, and 13 times higher bending rigidity. Now, for anybody who uh, knows anything about those properties, any engineering students or anything, you can, you can see that compared to steel or uh, spider web, even, this is a breakthrough. And here's what it looks like. This material right here. This is graphene. It's made out of carbon. It's uh, the hexagonal carbon molecule. It's a truly uh, 2D matter. So in this 3D realm, we've been aspiring to create uh, some sort of technology that is truly two-dimensional, which means one atom thick. Now, they've done that. They've isolated the carbon mo molecule into a two-dimensional hexagonal structure, and then they start layering it on top of each other in perfect hexagonal you know, stacking until you have something that looks about like a postage stamp, but that little postage stamp right there is uh, all the things that I just said, you know, tensile strength, density, rigidity, and not to mention cost, because it's made of carbon, the most uh, abundant element on the face of the earth. It is cheap. And the people uh, won a Nobel Prize uh, late last year for making this uh, economically viable, being able to produce this on a mass scale uh, so that's what you see right now. But in the future, I think we're going to see aircraft and skyscrapers and all sorts of uh, electrical um, semiconductor properties uh, compatible with the body because we're made of carbon. carbon. So the, the application to this cheap material is incredible. So... There's a quote that I started here. I uh, started talking about it in earlier talks. The novel, 19th century. Cinema, 20th century. What's going to be big in the 21st century in terms of media? The interface. We see the in interface becoming more intuitive and fun and useful all the time. The iPad is a great example of it. The, I the iPhone 4, great example. And the interface, what is that really? Interface is uh, another fancy way of talking about uh, how we share media. And I see this uh, symbiotic relationship with our technology, uh, taking what is analog in our world and making it digital, and then in turn taking things that are created digitally and finding out ways to make them analog. It's truly uh, two different dimensions with a line that used to be quite clear separating them. That line's getting more and more blurry. Let me show you some examples of that. Here is a picture, but it's a picture of two different kinds of pictures, uh, 2D and 3D. This is a 3D scan of the geometric structure of a human being. And it is made by taking pictures from all different angles of this man. Uh, 360 degrees this way and this way. So we know what he looks like from every direction. 
using that technology, were able to then recreate his, you know, his structure, his polygons, his volume. And then he looks like, uh, you know, grain. Then we also take pictures of all the fine details of his skin. And when you put it together, you can completely reproduce the image of this man uh, in, a, in a 3D digital environment. When we add light, you can see that even though it is just, you know, the head, the picture of a man, you can see when some light shines on him how absolutely realistic that looks. Hollywood is using this now for special effects. If you can take the image and likeness of a very famous person who's also very busy and work out in the details of their contract that we just need to take some pictures, come into the studio for an afternoon, we'll take pictures using a camera that circles around and up above you like an MRI sort of, and when we're done, then you don't have to do anything else except come in and record voiceover for the commercial that we make of you. And uh, we'll pay you the same as if you were here. That is what Hollywood is doing. Video games are using this technology to make video games more compelling and interesting than they've ever been before. Second Life. A lot of people may not know what this is yet, but it is a, uh, a digital world where you can create photorealistic avatars of yourself and wander around talking to other photorealistic avatars of other people in the world. And this has gone from being quite basic to extremely complicated in the last few years. So these are examples of us taking the analog, making them digital. This is a cast of Immanuel Kant, who is a philosopher, German philosopher. And we have art like this, not just of Immanuel here, but uh, of all different kinds of figures going all the way back to really early dimes. Some of you might recognize this. This is the Shroud of Turin, and it is supposed to have the image of Jesus on it. So if we have these analog relics of people from the past, and we have this new digital technology, we may be able to bring people like Kant and Jesus back to life in our digital landscape. Why would we do that? For educational purposes. But it works both ways. This is a figurine uh, made with pewter. We're able to print in, in more and more metals and composite structures. 3D printing is what it's called. And if you can design something digitally, you can reproduce it in the analog world. So uh, if your dad or your uncle likes to sail, you could take a few pictures of his face and make a figurine where he can open it up on Father's Day or Christmas and say, oh, it's me. Isn't that neat? What, what might we also be able to do with this? Uh, if you know anybody who's ever lost a part of themselves, a hand or a foot or a leg, imagine being able to uh, recreate the image of that appendage and uh, print a new hand, something that actually works, actually looks kind of cool. We're, of course, doing imaging of people right now uh, in utero and using what we can learn about a person before they're even born to uh, make diagnoses and just to make sure that everything is going smoothly. We can also make some quite beautiful art just by taking pictures of people and printing them. This is what the printer looks like, these 3D printers. You print, your, this is a prototype, you'll see more and more of these as we get uh, farther into the 21st century. We're right there on your desktop next to your iPhone and your personal computer is a printer where if, uh, say you lose the nose piece for your glasses, you can go to lens crafters and have them uh, repair your glasses or you can take a picture of the nose piece that is left and print yourself a new one without having to leave the house. Of course, the world faces some pretty big problems, like how are we going to bring clean water? It's very easy for me to 
be here in this ivory tower talking about how I want to print myself a new nose pad with my 3D printer. Meanwhile, half the people uh, on Earth can't get a clean drink of water or take a bath if they want to. We can use our new technology and graphene to create filters that will filter water on an atomic level and purify water like we've never been able to do before. I think that's a great problem to solve with this new technology. How to, how to purify Lake Superior. Let's make Lake Superior, you know, just hydrogen and oxygen. It's especially uh, easy to measure and to track progress using our, all our statistical, you know, software. It's easier to track the purity of water than it is to track the purity of air. And I see all these people uh, with their initiatives to, you know, have a greener, uh, less carbon footprint, all of these sort of hard-to-measure things. Why not apply some of that technology and some of those ambitions to the problem of clean water? I think that is important, especially when we know that less than 50% of people in Africa have access to safe, clean water, and we now have a technology that can filter things on an atomic level. Here's some examples of what that 3D printer will print. It's pretty neat. I was trying to explain to my wife how this might be applicable to her uh, in a more fun, user-friendly way. She likes to accessorize. She has a style blog, and if she could get into designing her own jewelry and all of that stuff, she might, she might like that. I, of course, want to create these. I think once we have graphene, we'll take the structure of an eagle feather, reproduce it using graphene, lighter uh, and better, and made of carbon, just like the eagle wing, and print for ourselves, you know, two pound, 12 foot uh, wingspans and uh, cruise around. I think that might be a lot of fun. If we can visualize it digitally, we can produce it in the analog world. It's going to revolutionize uh, pretty much every field, and we're just getting warmed up. So that is a little bit about, about the state of the technology. And hopefully it all applies to media in some way, because uh, I like to take these ideas and use them for media. If nothing else, you can see that the way we recorded things today is an important way to share whatever you're thinking about. So thank you for your time, and I'll see you next time.